Now, Major, I've been itching to get to this. What in the world is this in my stage? This is the largest scale model of Noah's Ark in the world. Uh, what's the story behind this thing? Well, I needed a way to show students on a secular campus that the biblical story of creation and Noah's flood was true. And I figured that the best way to do that was to actually build the ark so they could see with their eyes how big it was and that it would easily contain every kind of animal in the world. Professor Coleman, uh, say someone has never ever heard of the story of Noah and the flood. Could you, could you break down for us really quickly, what is that story all about? Well, it was after the world had been in existence for 1656 years and God decided that because of their wickedness and their violence that he was going to destroy the world. And he ordered Noah to build an ark. And as you can see, that ark was four, 540 feet long. On its launch platform, it would have stood 100 feet wide and been 80, 100 feet high and been 80 feet wide. And this is its size compared to modern ob objects that you can see today. The, the entire flood lasted for over a year and it covered all the land on the entire planet. Wow. You know, prior to me becoming a believer in the Bible, I had learned even in Hinduism about the story of a worldwide flood and how a family was preserved during that worldwide flood. Now, I heard this story exist in many different cultures. How do we know that the biblical story is the most accurate story? Okay, well, the best way to test that, again, is with science and understand exactly how the flood happened. Um, before Noah's flood, there was a subterranean water chamber 60 miles down beneath the Earth's crust, which is 60 miles of granite. That water was under tremendous pressure and increasing temperature until it reached about 1,000 degrees. Once the crust cracked, it burst forth with the power of a trillion billion atomic bombs. Dr. Walter Brown is the one who invented hydroplate theory, and he has shown us exactly how the flood happened. What's so amazing is not that all living life was destroyed. What's so amazing is that eight people and the animals inside the ark actually survived, and it would take a boat like this for them to survive. So if I'm hearing this correctly, what you do in your presentations and in your course is you take this replica uh, of a story that's found in the book of Genesis and, and you present the reasonableness of this story. Yes, we show that it was actually could work, that it, that it did work. The first boat in the world that was actually built larger than Noah's Ark was probably the most famous ship and that was the Titanic. It was the first boat that was ever built that was larger than Noah's Ark. And that boat sunk. <laughs> yes, and it sunk, but Noah's Ark did not sink. It, it actually survived. And when you can see this, when I say this is the largest authentic model of Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark was not made out of lumber. It was made out of hewn logs and put together with wooden posts. Um, the walls were three feet thick, okay? There's no such thing as a 540-foot long tree today. So you cannot build a full-size full model of Noah's Ark. This is the largest correct-to-scale model that exists. So uh, I'm sure a lot of skeptics ask you this question, and that is this. Wait a minute. All the life that exists in our world today, that's all the animals, uh, that's all the, the, the birds, uh, the, the, the land animals, yes. all of that came from Noah's Ark. How in the world did God fit all those animals upon this boat? Well, if you, if you look at an encyclopedia of life forms, there are, eight, there are 90 s of s genus forms of life that exist now. The average size, so 90, 90 different kinds. If you count those 90 different kinds of animals and you take the largest species in every genus, by the time you get to the middle one, number 45, you're down to the size of a rat. There were 15,000 animals on the ark, and the average size, even if you include a brachiosaurus, um, almost 70 feet long, 110,000 pounds, the average size on the animal of an animal on the size of the ark was the size of a rat. So um, Noah could have had 15,000 rat-sized animals and cages on the ark. The total volume of the ark was 2.2 2 .2 million cubic feet, um, 15,000 cages, four cubic feet, would take up about um, 
about 25% of the space on the ark. So most of it was empty. Wow, wow, that's incredible. Most of it was empty. And so when, when Noah's ark landed in those mountains, what I'm hearing from you is those kinds or those uh, family groups, they went out and they begin to multiply and fill the world. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so after you have, if you have different kinds of animals or genus of animals, that is, um, they can, you can have different species that come from that. So for instance, wolves, coyotes, dinkos, foxes, they are all dogs. Okay. Right. So you would only need one type of dog on the ark that would be four dogs, two males, two females, that could produce all those different species and the same things with the other animals. Let me ask you this question, which is, why are you so interested in this biblical story as opposed to any other biblical story? Well, there, that is because, first of all, Jesus believed in the flood model and it's the, it's the basis for the entire authenticity of the Bible. If you can prove that the Genesis story is false, you have destroyed the entire belief system that, on which Christianity is based. So that's why we use this model to show people that Noah's Ark was real and that the story is true. Well, couldn't the story have been symbolic metaphor for other kinds of events that took place? How about creation? Couldn't that have been symbolic or, or metaphorical in, in the language that's there? Well, it, it is possible, but when we look at the uh, four postulates of creation and we compare them with the four postulates of evolution, only the postulates of creation have been observed. Evolution is based on four major ideas. None of them have ever been observed. Number one, that life comes from non-life. We have not one single example of life coming from non-life. Number two, that all the life forms that we have today came from single cell life forms. Many people do not know that while we do have single cell life forms that we call bacteria, we have no two cell life forms. We don't have three cell life forms. We don't have four cell life forms. We don't even have five cell life forms. That is, we go from single cell bacteria to complex life forms. So there's no evidence that all life comes from single cell life forms. The, the, the third postulate of evolution is that time and chance drive evolution forward, of course, and time works against evolution. The chance of one simple 100 unit protein coming together by accident is, this is a very big number. Time and chance make evolution absolutely impossible. The fourth postulate that evolution is based on is that um, what we see today Minor genetic variation in species is evidence of macroevolution. So because cats are different colors, dogs are different sizes, that means that fish turned into cows. And of course, we know that that's not true because uh, Mendel proved that all the genes that exist today, you can shuffle them around, but there are no new genes that created, were created.